Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. For this week's video, I wanted to continue my retro GPU breakdown series that I started early last month, with this week's focus being on the legendary Nintendo 64 and its reality co-processor that powers the graphics for the console. I have so many fond memories of this console. It was the first console I ever owned. I had it for a long time, and although I never used to think about hardware back during those days, today that's what I love to do in my free time, learn about computer and console hardware and figuring out how they work, that said, before we begin, if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing for more weekly tech videos where I break down current and retro console and computer hardware, as well as occasionally go over tech news and rumors. I try to make at least one video per week during my free time and would love for you to stick around for future videos if you're interested in that type of thing. Finally, if this video was pleasant to you at all, make sure to smash the like button so that way YouTube is more likely to show this video to someone who may enjoy it as well. I really appreciate all your support. Now let's get into it. The Nintendo 64 was a very powerful console for its time, and although it was a complex machine, this allowed it to be inadvertently pretty advanced, especially when compared to its competition like the Sony PlayStation, Sega Saturn, and the Atari Jaguar. The N64's true powerhouse was the aforementioned Reality Co. processor, developed in collaboration with Silicon Graphics, otherwise known as SGI, and the chip ran at a 62 MHz clock speed, which may sound minuscule compared to today especially, but at the time, it was pretty high and held the title for the highest clock speed available of all 5th generation consoles when it came to the graphics processor. The Reality Co. processor can be broken down and split into two main parts. The Reality Signal Processor, or the RSP, and the Reality Display Processor, or the RDP. The Reality Signal Processor was in charge of actually executing audio and graphics tasks. Think of it as a specialized engine designed to handle complex 3D math. It had a scalar unit for arithmetic and basic operations, a vector unit for 3D transformations and lighting, and instruction memory and data memory to store microcode and process data. Because these tasks were offloaded to the RSP, the CPU, which was a relatively powerful 64-bit VR4300 CPU that could run 125 million instructions per second, could then focus on other things. And I will cover the CPU in a separate video at some other point in time, but this was a major advantage, especially in 3D heavy games that the Nintendo 64 introduced. By offloading these intensive tasks, the CPU is not overloaded with graphics and audio processing, allowing it to focus on game logic, AI, and other computational needs, leading to a more efficient and optimized gaming experience. Then we have the Reality Display Processor, which was the graphics pipeline for handling final image rendering. It included the rasterizer to convert vector data to pixels, a texture unit, a color combiner, blender for effects like transparency, memory interface for transferring data, to and from the CPU and the RAM, like a RAM bus. The RDP even had four kilobytes worth of texture cache, referred to as TMEM, and it even had a half a megabyte of embedded memory as well, which isn't often discussed when talking about the four megabyte available base RAM for the system, which we will definitely touch on later. But this half a megabyte of embedded memory is similar to dedicated VRAM and GPUs today and was responsible solely for graphics operations and was separate from the four megabytes of RAM used by the CPU and the RSP. Both of these were very helpful for the Nintendo 64, starting with the four kilobyte texture cache, which was significant as instead of constantly fetching textures from a memory, the GPU could quickly access them from this tiny but speedy cache. However, four kilobytes is admittedly very small, even back then. So developers had to be clever. Sometimes they use compressed textures or use microcode that stream them in chunks. Some bigger game cartridges also came with additional memory on board, which was used to help bypass these limitations by developers, although of course, it's not as fast or as optimal as using the memory as intended, but it did provide a workaround when needed at least. Next, the addition of half a meg of embedded memory was specifically important because it enabled and assisted with things such as z-buffering, which allows for proper depth calculation and occlusion calling, meaning farther objects could be hidden behind closer ones properly and be placed and seen correctly in the game world by the player. Alpha blending for realistic transparency effects, any aliasing for smoothing out edges on objects, and then when you combine the rest of the hardware inside the RDP and its configuration, it also showed other graphical features too, such as hardware texture mapping, allowing textures to be applied directly to 3D models, trilinear filtering, and MIP mapping to enhance texture quality at various distances, perspective correction, which ensures textures don't warp incorrectly, and even environment mapping, which is able to simulate basic reflections and lighting effects, and these are just some examples. Basically, there was a ton of forward thinking crammed into this one console. 
But as you can tell from everything I've already discussed, it gets very complicated. And although we have way more advanced hardware today that it almost seems alien compared to the 90s hardware that we used to game on, we do try to make things as straightforward as possible with today's hardware even being advanced as they are. For a brief comparison and example, the N64 relied on fixed function pipelines, meaning tasks like lighting, texturing, and transformations had to follow predefined hardware routines requiring more time out of developers, even on primitive graphics compared to today. Modern consoles use fully programmable shader pipelines, allowing for dynamic lighting, physics-based rendering, otherwise known as PBR, real-time ray tracing, and advanced post-processing, and so much more that makes things dynamic and more streamlined, all within the game engine as needed. As a result, today, game developers have far more flexibility in how they render scenes, apply effects as compared to the old days, and with how advanced graphics in video games are today, it just makes sense to do this. Now, of course, with every graphics breakdown, and as promised earlier in the video, we do have to talk memory. So let's talk about the N64's RAM. The N64 used 4 megabytes of unified RD RAM, which could be expanded to 8 megabytes if you had the expansion pack. This unified approach meant developers could allocate that memory to either the system or graphics as they saw fit. Many consoles at the time had separate memory pools for graphics and the CPU, which could be limiting depending on the circumstance. The 4 megabytes of RAM alone was significant for the console, let alone the unified architecture, as it was at least double the available system RAM than any of its other competitors at the time, and helped allow relatively large open game worlds for the 90s like Super Mario 64, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, and Banjo-Kazooie. All because the N64 had enough RAM to store level geometry, textures, character models, and object data in real time. The N64's RD RAM also boasted an impressive theoretical bandwidth of up to 500 plus megabytes per second, which was extremely high for a home console back then. It allowed fast data transfers, critical for those big 3D worlds, and helped with loading times on the machine alongside the cartridge-based game technology. So you might be asking, if the N64 for a 5th gen console is so powerful, then why were people often misconstruing it as being weak, and why was there a bad reputation behind the console having blocky graphics? Well, the main reason was storage restrictions on N64 cartridges, and one could also argue the harder to develop for and code for hardware that the N64 had. This is why the N64 did have large open environments with impressive draw distances and effects for its time on a home console, but lacked really impressive textures, and the cartridges held back the max potential of the system. So then why did Nintendo go to cartridges in an age where everyone was moving to CDs? Well, Nintendo stuck with cartridges for a few reasons. One is speed. Cartridges could be read very quickly, meaning instant load times, especially with the fast and large amount of system RAM available. If you back up the fact that cartridges could be read so quick, it allowed developers to use cartridges in unique and interesting creative ways, such as bypassing memory for performance gains. And the second is a direct interface. The game cartridge could directly interface with the Reality Coprocessor, further speeding up data transfers and allowing developers to get clever as I mentioned before. But as I said, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. Cartridges couldn't hold as much data as CDs, which meant developers had to be really efficient. Textures often suffered, animated or live video cutscenes were often absent to the N64 or flat out reduced heavily, as well as audio quality being a little more compressed. Cartridges were also more expensive to produce, which combined with the complex hardware to code for led some third-party developers to jump ship for disc-based consoles completely. Now, I don't want this video to get too long and too in-depth, as it appears the majority of my audience that do enjoy these tech breakdowns, especially the retro ones, prefer that I don't go too crazy in the details. But to summarize, the N64 was a beast for its time, and was the most advanced console during the fifth generation of consoles due to the powerful hardware and clever design, but was often held back from making all of that apparent at first glance due to cartridge size restrictions, and hardware that was hard to develop for. But boy, when done well, games could really look amazing on this thing, and I personally love the console and have so many great memories with it, so I am a little biased, I admit, because it was my first console and we all don't forget our first. But it was also what started my love for all the franchises within the Nintendo ecosystem that I love and still play today on the Nintendo Switch and will continue to play on the upcoming Nintendo Switch 2. But this is all I have for you in today's video. If you watched this far, please comment below that you watched to the end and let me know if you still have your N64 from back in the day. That way I can personally thank you for supporting me and also engage with you in the comments. I hope you all have a great morning, day, or evening, and I'll see you all in the next video. Peace.